والصلاه والسلام على المبعوث رحمه للعالمين وعلى اله وصحبه ومن استنى بسنته الى يوم الدين السلام عليكم ورحمه الله وبركاته so we pray that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala send his angels whose work in this universe is to seek forgiveness and ask for blessings and favors for the believers who seek to take their lives and their time and their effort for the service of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Particularly because we have a choice to spend our time doing something else. And so seeking the knowledge of the fountain of prophethood and how that affected people and trying to look at ourselves and think how do we become better people? How do we raise our spiritual status with the guidance that was revealed to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? So if you remember last week, we were talking about how as a new Muslim, uh, Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he was very adamant about learning from the Qur'an. And this, the reasoning behind this is something that we should take note of. It goes back to Umar whenever he was a young man and he was learning uh, the Arabic language from the poets and the scribes. And now if, we, if you remember, for, first of all, the common modern standard of education had not been invented. It's a long ways away from being invented. Back then, education was just life experience, you know. And very few people became literate. Literacy, knowing how to read and write and understand the complexity of uh, linguistics uh, was not common until very recently. So in Mecca, maybe at best 10% of the population knew how to read and write. Okay, So Omar, his parents and his family, particularly his grandfather, were adamant about him studying and learning the Arabic language, reading, writing, poetic, eloquence, and so forth. So he spent a lot of time doing that. So he had an educational regimen or a uh, program that he was used to and that led him to have a certain standard of understanding learning and the learning process, a scientific method. So also it's narrated that after Omar got into his late teenage years, he aspired like his grandfather Tufail to be a Nufail, to be a respected person of the society. And so he found and he sought out um, the father of Abu Sufyan. His name was Harb ibn Umayyah. And so he used to go to him daily, uh, ask, and he was an elderly man there, but he was seen as one of the wise, elder, noble folk. And so Omar used to go to him and sit with him and learn the ways of the Arabs, the way of the Quraysh, the history of the Quraysh. What makes them great? What is their nobility? And because he knows all this poetry, Nufail and uh, Harb ibn Umayyah used to remind him of certain lines of poetry that he would take to heart. And so we see that's one of the reasons why Omar was such, it's very ironic and interesting, that he was such a big defender of the Meccan way of life. And so when Islam was first starting to be spread and the Prophet Muhammad wasallam started talking about the oneness of God and how these idols they're worshipping are not uh, gods, Omar was offended because the gods are a cornerstone of the society. And he sees that as part of their dignity and who they are. He was a conservative Arab man. So similarly, a lot of the values the Qur'an talked about, for example, uh, completely eradicating tribalism. Tribalism was the cornerstone. That's how you became great. Particularly what tribe you're from and what your place in that tribe is. So Islam started to remove that. Similarly, Islam was saying that slaves can be better than masters if they have pure faith and good deeds. So Islam removed the caste class system of status. So this is taking away from Omar the uh, lifestyle of Mecca, right? So when he embraced Islam, the opposite happened. He became the biggest defender of Islam because he spent time with the Prophet ﷺ and he was adamant about taking his learning methodology that he grew up with and applying it to uh, learning the Qur'an and the Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. So he started to soak up the Qur'an and the Sunnah. So after he made his hijrah, as we talked about last week, now he comes to Medina and the people are there. And when the Prophet Wasallam's camel stopped in the place uh, in modern day Medina, which was back then called Yathrib, he told the companions after the next day, he says, we're going to build the mosque here. 
So Omar spent time with his family and with his servants building the mosque. All of the companions spent all their time building the mosque together. That was the first most important thing. So then Omar decided to get a place in a place called Al Awali, which is a Dahiya, a little uh, neighborhood by the, the Prophet's mosque, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Other companions were not as you know stable financially and they got houses that were they built houses and got houses that were closer to the marketplace, which is a little bit farther from the mosque. But Omar wanted to be close to the mosque. So he got himself a house right uh, down the street from the mosque. You see, and that's obviously a lesson. To, to have homes close to the mosque is a sign of devotion to Islam and the Muslim community. And so, number one, we should have mosques in places where people can easily access them and everybody should be welcome to the mosque that believes in Islam, right? So then Omar, he made a deal with his neighbors. And this is a very interesting point. He made this deal with his neighbors that we have to use our time wisely with the Prophet ﷺ. Obviously, he's going to every single prayer. Fajr, Dhuhr, Asr, Maghrib, Asha. He's in the front row, Omar of course. But the Prophet ﷺ now has a huge group of believers to serve. And the Prophet ﷺ was a just man. And so he cannot have, we hear a lot about Abu Bakr and Umar and Ali radiallahu anhum ajma'in being close to the Prophet sallallahu But when he started in Medina, now you have all these Ansar, all of these helper people who built this bedrock for this new Islamic state to be formed and they want to get to know the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam, he made a decree. He said, every day certain people can come and so you have to take your turn. You have to get in line to come. So you know what Omar said? He said, let's make it for his surrounding neighbors that I go this day, I'm going some Monday, you're going to go Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and we're going to set it up like this. So that if I go, I soak up some new verses of the Qur'an, I learn some of the teachings and, and example of the Prophet Wasallam or some news about the situation of the believers and take the Prophet's advice, and then I bring it back, and then we all get together and we talk about what we learn. So then the next day you will go to the Prophet Sallallahu and spend some time with him and learn from him and ask him of any of the verses revealed and then you will bring that back on Tuesday and then we'll all sit and bring our families and talk about it and grow and learn. You see? So now first we see Omar, his plan is about growing in knowledge and understanding by seeking closeness to the one whom the revelation is sent to. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And then he has a da'wah campaign. I'm getting all my neighbors involved in a plan to where we can most maximize our benefit of knowing Islam through the Prophet ﷺ. So they structured a systematic uh, means of taking knowledge from the Prophet ﷺ. Now we have to think about ourselves. How many times a day of the week and how much time in the, day, in the week do we spend getting together our family and friends to learn and grow in knowledge of the Qur'an and the Sunnah, right? This is a question to ask ourselves. And so somebody might say, well, Omar radiallahu anhu, he's like not human. No, he's human. That's the whole point. He is a human being, just like me and you. He used to drink, as, as far as what we know, he still drinks alcohol at this point in the seerah, according to the uh, hadith we mentioned before, that's authentic in the Surah Al-Ma'idah and its tafsir about when Omar finally uh, gave it up because the ayah was finally prohibiting it. But at the same time, we see that there is a very strong focus with what he knows of Islam to soak it up and grow and learn the religion, you see, with whatever means he possibly can. So we, this is a human being with shortcomings and weaknesses. He is dedicating his life to the religion. Now, somebody might say, well, I have family and I have jobs and all that. Shaitan's tricking you. I couldn't come to Fajr, why? I couldn't come to the lesson, why? And this and that and the other. Omar did not make such an excuse. And he had more than one wife and he had many children as we talked about before. And he had a successful business that he ran. So the point that we're learning here is those aren't excuses. This is what Omar is teaching us. This is the point of learning this. Is that you cannot sit here and try to convince yourself that taking a couple hours out of my week to dedicate to learn the religion is some big hardship. When we see Omar, one of the greatest leaders, that was the most important thing to him. 
The reason why we come here to learn this is so that we can learn from his example and become better people, right? So we need to make sure that we spend some time with our family and with our friends at the Islamic Center, in our homes, and the purpose of our gathering is to literally open up the Qur'an, read it together, talk about the hadith of the Prophet Wasallam, discuss it, and then if we have some issues, try to go to somebody more knowledgeable to help us to understand our, our, our understanding properly, right? So this is Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu, and he is taking up from the fountain of prophethood. And this is the uh, the means by which Omar's heart went from that uh, harsh, rigid, polytheist, conservative, Qurayshi, Arab, tribalist man um, to this pious, Muslim, righteous, good-hearted, well-intended for all of creation person. It was a purification process. And it's mentioned in Surah Al-Imran. It is the fulfillment of the Abrahamic prophecy. So Abraham prayed to God with his son. He says, Send in our progeny a great prophet who will come teaching the people the knowledge and the wisdom of the book and purifying them, right? You are the one that can do all of this. And so then the Holy Quran says in Surah Al Imran, لَقَدْ مَنَّ اللَّهُ عَلَى الْمُؤْمِنِينَ إِذْ بَعَثَ فِيهِمْ رَسُولًا مِنْ أَنفُسِهِمْ يَتْلُو عَلَيْهِمْ يَتْلُو عَلَيْهِمْ آيَاتِهِ وَيُعَلِّمُهُ وَيُزَكِّيهِمْ وَيُعَلِّمُهُمُ الْكِتَابَ وَالْحِكْمَةِ وَإِنْ كَانُوا مِنْ قَبْلُ لَفِي ضَلَالٍ مُبِينٍ So this ayah, and it's interesting because of the mistake I made, is because in Surah Al-Baqarah, Abraham put يُعَلِّمُهُمُ الْكِتَابَ وَالْحِكْمَةِ before يُزَكِّيهِمْ This is Abraham's dua, alayhi salatu was salam. He was thinking that first you come to know all the rules and regulations of the scripture, then you will be purified. And in this ayah and in the other ayah, Surah Al-Jum'ah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who is perfect and knows exactly the correct order, He puts Yuzakihim first, right? And so this Tazkiyah comes from companionship with the righteous. Just learning, not pay close attention, just learning information will not fix you. I know for sure. I had a translation of the Qur'an in 1998 that I embraced as the Word of God. And I kept believing that for over a year and a half. But my friends and the people who I hung out with were not following that. And I was not a changed person. I was not a righteous person. I had major hypocrisy and confusion in my life. Even though my mind and my heart was dedicated to a, to a belief system and values, I wasn't able to do that because Tezkiyah was not an environment that I embraced. So being around the Prophet ﷺ and the other righteous companions, living close to the mosque, going to the mosque, really this is tazkiyah. And if you don't do that, then يُعَلِّمُهُمْ كِتَابُ الْحِكْمَ لَا يفيدك. If you know the verses of the book and then the hadith of the Prophet, it will not benefit you if you don't have the tazkiyah. Tazkiyah comes first. And there was a famous sheikh of mine in Egypt I was very uh, impressed by. MashaAllah at the time he was 24 years old, he was the imam of the masjid. And uh, one day we were talking, and I'm sure he noticed, you know, uh, that at that time I was about his age. And uh, he was telling me about da'wah and things like this. And he says, a, Muslim, a real pious Muslim, uh, the one who has knowledge, it has to have the right place to come from. It has to come from a good heart. And I said, what do you mean? He said, if you know a lot of verses of the Qur'an, and you know hadith, and you learned about that stuff, but your heart is all dirty. He said, basically what it's like is, you come to somebody with a tray, you know? You know the silver trays? But not real silver, because we don't serve on silver trays, right? But it's just steel, right? So they have the steel tray, and then there's this kind of mold and dirt and filth on it. But then on top of that, you have all this very ripe, fresh, beautiful looking fruits, right? So we go to the people and we say, here, look at these fruits. And they look on the tray and they're like, I don't, know, I don't want any of that. So the sheikh was saying, no matter what you do, if people don't see the purity of the heart behind the knowledge, the knowledge means nothing to them. And this is funny because this is what my mom said, you know. Um, my mom was talking about preaching religion and all this and how people like to what they call Bible beat and all of that. And she said they don't have any real character and so forth. And she said, at the end of the day, people aren't looking. The common person isn't looking for you to convince them of the proofs of religion. 
They want to see something that they yearn in a spiritual lifestyle, in a character, in an attitude, in a special quality of, of humanity that they can relate to and say, I want what that person has. You see what I'm saying? So that's what was happening with Omar. Omar's purification process in being close to the mosque with the Prophet, gathering his friends and together purifying their hearts. Then when they learned the ayahs and the verses of the Qur'an and the hadith of the Prophet, it had very, very comfortable, clean, pure place to go to. And then whenever it was brought out to others, it was easily accepted and soaked up. So Omar, uh, as this invested student of the Qur'an and the Sunnah, he was adamant about making that the core focus of his life. Right? So there's a famous hadith on the point. The Prophet ﷺ narrated and he said that uh, I went to sleep one night and I had this amazing dream. And so I'm in this dream and I wake up and I see this beautiful place and some very nice person comes up to me and hands me this um, you know, cup of milk. And this milk looks so fresh and it smells so good. And I started drinking and I felt like I could just drink more and more of that milk. And so the Prophet ﷺ said, I drank so much of the milk, I looked at my fingers and it looked like there was milk coming out of my fingers. And then he said, so I turned and I saw Umar ibn al-Khattab and I gave him the cup. And then he started to drink from it. And the companion said, What is the, what is the you know, meaning of this dream you had? And he said, I was being given the blessed knowledge of the religion. And I pass it on to Umar. Uh, Ibn Hajj al-Asqalani, the famous hadith scholar, in his uh, explanation of Sahih al-Bukhari, it's called Fath al-Bari, he basically explained this by saying, huwa al-ilmu bi siyasat al-nas fi tatbiq al-Qur'an wa sunnah bil hikmah He said, it is the knowledge of the right way of dealing with people and situations according to scriptural wisdom. Right? So this is, this, and we see this in Umar, by the way. As I've said before, and I gave a whole sermon, mashallah, ISGC, Abu Hanifa radiallahu anhu was this great deep thinker. And part of that was that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had blessed him with that by just a gift in his self. But a, a large part of that was Abdullah ibn Mas'ud got half of his madhab understanding from Umar ibn al-Khattab. And Umar had a very deep analysis. So for example, when we look at this hadith, so someday, nowadays when scholars start to think big and start to make uh, deep interpretations, some people accuse them, oh, they're making something, you know, something strange in the religion. When really they're ap applying a very prophetic principle. So when Omar found these people and they stole all this stuff, and the people said, we're going to take their hands off, he asked them, why did they steal? And they complained that there's, you know, no, I don't have any work and I've got to feed my family. And so I just stole some barley and some wheat and dates. And so then Omar, he suspended the law of the Qur'an. The verse of the Qur'an says if somebody stole that much, then their hand would be removed, right? And so Omar said, do not take their hands. Because I'm saying that the spirit of the law, the wisdom of the law, is for people who are just trying to make a come up or make some earning. This is some jahiliya talk. Make an earning off of people's wealth without earning anything for themselves. It's not for somebody who's starving and trying to take care of their family. So Omar's making an interpretation of the ayah and now he's interpreting it in opposition to a literal understanding because of a principled objective base. And so this is the hadith. And this is a famous hadith as well. He says, فَإِن مِنْكُمْ مِنَ الْمُحَدِّثِينَ وَإِيَّكُنْ Omar." If there was going to be someone like the previous people who used to talk with wisdom and inspiration as the Arabs knew, then if it was going to be from the Prophet Sallallahu Ummah, it would be Omar. Right? And he said, if there was going to be a prophet after me, it would be Umar. Anhu. So he had this very deep insight, and this was one of the applications of that. Now, obviously the Umar, عنه, he loves the Prophet وسلم, so much, and he's very dear to uh, his heart. So one time, Umar standing in a gathering with the Prophet وسلم, and the companions, and the Prophet وسلم, he said, he's talking about the pillars of faith. And so he said, none of you is a real believer until... Uh, your, I am more beloved to you than your father, your children, your brothers, your sisters, and all of the people of the earth. So when Umar heard that, he called out, he said, Ya Rasulullah, you are more beloved to me than everything in this world except for myself. And then the Prophet Wasallam says, and yourself included, Umar. He said, then in, in myself included. And then the Prophet Wasallam said, 
And now you have seen the truth of faith. Now somebody might say it sounds selfish of Omar to say that. But it's a, it's a logical understanding of what the Prophet ﷺ said. And so there is لا يكلف الله نفسا إلا وسعها لها ما كسبت وعليها ما اكتسبت We are all charged with responsibility over ourselves. Right? This is a big responsibility we have. And so we need to make sure we take care of it very well because on the Day of Judgment, first and foremost, we're going to be asked about what we did with ourselves. Right? So when, all, when the Prophet ﷺ said, you to be believers, you must have your parents and your kids and, your, and all the people. More, I must be more beloved to you than them. He didn't say, and yourself. Right? So Omar was just making an interpretation of what he said. And this is a, not a selfish thing. This is a careful uh, thing to think. I will mean, take care of myself out of my love for the Prophet ﷺ. So at this point, uh, the Prophet ﷺ became the most beloved person to the Prophet ﷺ. Uh, out of everything that exists in the universe. So there was one time that Omar was talking about going to make Umrah, uh, and this is before actually the uh, the Hijrah. So the Omar is going to go make his Tawaf and his Sa'i and all of this. And so he tells the Prophet ﷺ, I'm going to go do an Umrah. And so then the Prophet ﷺ told him, he says, Ya akhi, la tansana min du'aik. Omar, he says, my, my dear brother, don't forget us in your prayers. Omar's face lit up and his whole time he kept telling everybody in this whole Umrah that the most amazing thing happened to me. And they said, what? He said, Rasulullah said, Ya Akhi to me. He said to me, my dear brother. And that is more beloved and more special to me than anything in this world and everything in it. This is the love that Omar had for the Prophet and when you have that much love for someone, you're going to spend a lot of time with them and get to know them and try to follow in their footsteps in the way they do things. So now we need to take a step back in ourselves. And we think to ourselves, how much do I love the Prophet ﷺ? Going back to what we said before, the way you can gauge how much there's lip service or how much ghurur, how much trickery yourself or your shaitan may be playing with you about that, however much time you spend reading the, the seerah of the Prophet ﷺ, and reading the sunnah and the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ and its explanation and how much you do in your day following his example to the best of your ability, right? So those, those things will testify to you the extent of your real love for the Prophet ﷺ. So we have to be very careful to make sure that we don't say things. And it's a, very, it's a very easy point. It's easy to say, I love the Prophet, I love Islam, I know what the right thing to do is, and all of that. But doing it is a whole other world. And that's where Tazkiyah comes in. And as I said, Tazkiyah is only going to come when we build Muslim community, and people come together regularly in the masajid, in the houses, and there's this deep unity based on the love for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and His Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So now we get to the Battle of Badr. Battle of Badr is coming. So the Muslims are in Medina and they've, they've sent some spies out. And they're seeing that the Quraysh are sending big caravans. And some of these caravans have bought uh, weaponry and armor and so forth. And some of them are very, uh, you know, have a lot of wealth in them. And so the Prophet ﷺ, the verse was revealed to him from Surah Al-Hajj, أُذِنَ لِلَّذِينَ يُقَاتَلُونَ بِأَنَّهُمْ ظُلِمُوا That the believers who have been fought against and attacked and oppressed, it is now, they have the permission to fight back, right? And so the Prophet ﷺ told them that this is giving us the right to fight back against these aggressors for the last 13 years, and also a right to take back our wealth that was taken from us and that we were boycotted and sanctioned against over the three years and the final time of Mecca when Muslims were starved and so forth uh, then. So the Prophet ﷺ told his companions, it is in our best interest that we go out and make a preemptive strike see if we can't take from the caravan and stop them and uh, show them that you know they are wrong and we are in the right. So he asked the companions, what do you think about this? Abu Bakr stood up. Abu Bakr, he starts to talk. And he tells them, look, the Prophet ﷺ is right. We came over here with nothing. We were forced out of our lands. These people have enmity. They tried to assassinate the Prophet ﷺ. They tortured, um, um, abused, and humiliated us for all this time. We need to let them know 
that we will not take that and now we have our own state and we have our own strength and we will fight for it. So then Umar stood up عنه, and he basically said the same thing as Abu Bakr and he called for the Ansar. He called for the people of Medina. Look, the Prophet is actually, and here's his understanding, Umar has a deep understanding of things. What the Prophet is doing by asking us is basically revisiting the bay'ah. The pledge was to defend the Muslims and the Jews and the pagans of Medina from an outside attack. So he's telling you in an indirect way, I'm suggesting that we go out and meet them outside between Mecca and Medina. So that wasn't your bay'ah. You did not make allegiance. You did not give your pledge to such a campaign. So what do you think? And Sa'ad ibn Ubadah and others, they stood up and they said, we are with you, we will not be like um, the previous nation did and say, you and your Lord go fight, we're going to wait here for you. We will go with you and fight and our Lord will give us victory and make us uh, on a respectable status in Arabia. So they head out to go to this uh, Badr and they're going out to meet the people there. When they get there, Obviously, the Muslims were able to get a good spot in front of the wells to stop um, them from drinking on the other side. And after the battles, the original, um, I don't know what you call them, duels that took place in the beginning, uh, the Muslims uh, charged forth. And Omar, he took with him his servant, Mihja. Mihja. And so he said, Mihja, we're going to go in. And they went together side by side. And so when they were going into the battle, uh, one of the narrations says that Mihja is fighting on the side of Omar. And somebody saw Omar because he's very big and giant, as we said. And so somebody tried to come after him, one of the warriors of the Quraysh. And Mihja came and got in the way and ended up being the, the first martyr of the battle. Omar turned around and got him. And then Omar uh, turned around and saw his uncle, Al-As ibn Hisham. And then he told him, you are the, the evil doer here. And then he fought him and killed him. And then he spent that battle reminding people, I just killed my uncle, who else wants some? He said, this is a, we're not here for you know, culture and tribes and all that stuff. That stuff's gone down the tubes. Now we are talking about you people are evil, you have done wrong by us, you need to step back and know. So within a very short time, the Muslims were very amazingly miraculously supported in that this group of 300 some Quraysh and this group or this group of 1000 Quraysh and this group of 300 some Muslims uh, the Muslims have overcome them and you know killed many of their soldiers and then they took dozens of them captive so then the Muslims come back and they've thrown all of the you know dead bodies in this uh, old uh, unusable well and then uh, the Muslims started looking at these uh, captives, these prisoners of war. So Omar is walking by and he saw Abbas ibn Abdul Muttalib, the uncle of the Prophet He said, Ya Abbas, you know better than me that Muhammad sallallahu is the messenger of Allah. You know this. Why are you not giving in? Why aren't you just going to become Muslim and make your life easier? And Abbas didn't want to talk to him. And so then he told him, Abbas, I'm telling you right now, if you become Muslim, it will be more delighting and more beloved to me then if Khattab, he's referring to his father as he always does by his first name, which shows that there wasn't a very good relationship there. And so he says, because the Prophet ﷺ told me that out of all of these people, the one that I wish we would not have to fight is Abbas. And if he became Muslim, that would be a big support to the deen of Islam. So Omar said, you are more beloved to me as a Muslim because the Prophet ﷺ showed more value to, for you than for my own father. And this shows where the wala, where the loyalty and love is. It's for people who seek goodness and faith and justice and righteousness, not for people of tribe and family, even though they are corrupt and uh, evil and not following uh, religion. So this is why they called it the day of Al-Furqan, Yom Al-Furqan, is because people met and there were family members that fought each other. And the reason was is because these family members have expelled these people just for saying God is one. And their oppression was huge on them. And these people now have the right by divine, by divine will that it is time to step back, and, uh, step back to them and fight them and let them know <coughs> they are the criminals and they should be held accountable. So after the Muslims took all of these um, uh, captives, these POWs back to Medina, then there started to be a discussion about what are we going to do with these captives, right? 
And so uh, Abu Bakr told the Prophet وسلم, I think we should be wise here. I think we should take some ransom for these people. And I think that we should make some money in this way, right? Then he, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam asked Omar, what do you think? He said, I think these are the leaders of disbelief. And the main point why we fought them was to teach them a lesson that you should not start a war with the believers. And that you should stop all your aggression and your enmity and leave this way of hostility towards Islam. I think we should kill every last one of them. And so then the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam turned to Abu Bakr and in his mercy and compassion, all he knows is, I think that your idea is more merciful and compassionate like the Prophet Jesus. And he tells Omar, it seemed like you're very tough and rigid like the law of Moses. And so he took the opinion of Abu Bakr and they actually did uh, send a message and they were going to take ransom uh, from the people of Mecca. But then a week later, do you know what comes down? A verse from Surah Al-Anfal. مَا كَانَ لِنَبِيٍّ أَنْ يَكُونَ لَهُ أَسْرَى حَتَّى يُدْخِنَ فِي الْأَرْضِ The verse comes down of the Qur'an saying it is, not the right, it is not the right way for a prophet at this juncture to be taking POWs until they are established and respected in the land. And so this was a verse confirming that Omar's idea even though it sounded harsh it was... Uh, compatible to the situation that they were living in that these people need to fear causing harm and problems toward the Muslims they need to know that that is not going to work for them they need to know there's a serious recompense and that this is something unacceptable right so that's one of the six examples that we have narrated where the Prophet ﷺ did not receive an ayah but he asked his companions what do you think about this? What do you think about that? And they, he's consulting with them because the, the Quran says, وَشَاوِرْهُمْ فِي الْأَمْرِ God told the Prophet wasallam, consult your companions, giving the example for proper leadership, right? And Omar followed this example to the, to the letter. And to the extent that many of the governors he put, when the other people close to them came in numbers and gave evidence as to that governor's corruption, he listened to their consultation and removed the governor and sometimes had him publicly lashed. Because shura and consultation was dear to him. So this consultation uh, process was something very important. Now what we saw is that in six cases, when Omar gave his idea, and the Prophet ﷺ differed and took somebody else's. A verse of the Qur'an was revealed supporting Omar's idea in the beginning. And that just gives so much um, you know, strength to the veracity of Omar as a person, as a d devout servant of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In that he's using his... The Prophet ﷺ has opened the door. I don't know a revelation as to this situation. What do you think? Some people would say, some people might think, well, let's just go with whatever the Prophet said because we love the Prophet ﷺ, right? And we don't want to do something that he doesn't like, right? Omar was listening to the actual request of the Prophet, which is make your own ijtihad. Use your tools that you have, not fearing anybody's blame or what you think somebody else says, even if it's the Prophet ﷺ, and say whatever your opinion is. And so that concept of ijtihad was highly um, nurtured by Omar radiallahu anhu. Which is when you see, if you look at the history of the Hanafi Madhab, which is so much related to Omar, you see all these different ijtihadat. To the extent that it says, Qala uh, Imam al Madhab, Abu Hanifa, wa, wa uh, khilaf al Sahibain, Muhammad al Shaybani and Zufr, or Abu Yusuf. And you see all these differences of opinion amongst Abu, Abu Hanifa and his students. Why? Because he did the exact same thing. He encouraged them to use their knowledge and wisdom to the best of their ability and to discuss with him this issue and to stand firm on what they're sure about. And because Abu Hanifa is not a prophet, radiallahu anhu, he cannot tell them, you must follow my opinion, nor did he ever do this. Some other people started saying that later, and this is unfortunate because it hinders the depth of true Muslim spiritual intellectualism to listen to what the different scholars say and make an educated decision as we saw Omar radiallahu anhu doing time and time again throughout the seerah by the Prophet sallallahu encouragement and by the con confirmation above seven heavens by verses being revealed uh, r recommending such an act so finally we have a situation where 
uh, the Prophet uh, the Prophet's companions are reminiscing about Badr a few days after returning to Medina from the Battle of Badr. So they're talking, and this is what happened, and Abu Jahl came, and then Abdullah ibn Mas'ud came, and Ali did this, and they're all talking, and they're all remembering how the Muslims were miraculously defeating this polytheist um, uh, army. And so as they're talking, Omar says, I looked across the masjid, and I saw outside, and I saw Umair ibn Wahab, this one of the leaders of the Quraysh, that he has come up, and he is tying up his camel to the outside post and so Omar called out and so you, know, you never know <laughs> this is what the hadith says and he called he says stop that dog that evil man who has come here for no good everybody be aware of that man he was fighting against us a few days ago he is a no good person and so everybody turned around and they went and they got Umair ibn Wahab right and they said what is your what is your business here right and so he says uh, I came here just to talk to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, right? And they said, okay. So they brought him in and Omar is holding him one by one shoulder and he's holding his sword by the other. And he's holding him, bringing him in. So he comes in and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is sitting there. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, Omar, what is this? He said, this guy, you know who he is and he's got a sword with him. Why should we let him in? Why don't we take his sword? Oh, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, let him go. Let him sit down here with me and you can stand there, it's fine. So then Omer, he sat down in front of the Prophet and the Prophet says, Ma ja'abik, what has brought you here today? What are you, what are you coming here? He says, well, I was really concerned about these prisoners of war and I just wanted to come tell you that we are prepared in Mecca to pay the ransom for them and all of this. And the Prophet <laughs> said, no, 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 really. What did you come here for? And why do you have this sword with you? He says, no, I'm telling you. I just was wondering, you know, and then he says something corny. He says, what are these swords any good for anyways? Look what just happened to us in Badr. And this is not how an Arab man talks about himself, right? He would stand up and say, I have to defend myself. You know, this is the, what you call rujula. It's an Arab character trait, manhood. Right? It's not the way you would expect him to talk in front of the people. So the Prophet ﷺ told him again, he says, what really are you here for? And he said, I, I'm telling you. And the Prophet ﷺ here, he said, let me tell you something that I know. I know that you and Safwan ibn Umayyah met in Al-Hijr and you were talking about what happened in Badr and you were talking about revenge and then you had this courage and audacity to tell him I will go myself and assassinate the Prophet but the problem is I have some debts here in Mecca and I don't want to be a man that could possibly lose his life with debts. And so Safwan told you and held you to your word and said look I am now in front of the people going to take your debts. As long as you go do what you said. And so now here you sit in front of me. And you thought you were going to come here and kill me. But you don't know that Allah is protecting me from you. And so Umair's face and his mouth dropped to the ground. He said, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashhadu annaka rasulullah. I was in a small room with Safwan ibn Umayya when that happened. And nobody in all of Mecca knows that except for me and him. And to my knowledge, he's still there. So I know that for sure that you have received this news from the one that knows everything that is going on. And I hereby give my allegiance to you. So look at the flip-flop, what happened. So then Omar says, Allahu Akbar, and comes and hugs him. And he embraces him as his beloved brother. And the Prophet said, Omar, that is your companion. You go take him and teach him his religion. And Omar is smiling at him and calling him great names and all of this. And then they go and they spend time and time again learning whatever Omar knows of the Qur'an and of Islam. And this is the beauty of the Prophet ﷺ. And this is the beauty of his noble companion, the man of criterion, Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu anhu. Um, uh, if there's any questions, we can cover that. Other than that, Maghrib has come in. Inshallah, we're going. If there are any questions over the talk today, there's no problem. Or the general Omar point. Everything's clear, inshallah. Okay. Jazakumullah khairan. Inshallah, we'll uh, pray uh, Salat al-Maghrib now, inshallah.